Hi, welcome back to Philosophical Inquiry with your professor, Dr. Kovach. Well, we're coming up on the end here. I, I just have three more things to talk to you about this semester. What have we done so far? We talked about Socrates, we talked about Plato, we talked about the theory of forms, we talked about Aquinas' theory of human nature, we talked about Aquinas' theory of philosophy of religion, and we're going we're gonna to stay with the philosophy of religion theme for a little bit here. Because some of you, you have told me that uh, Aquinas was a little surprising. Aquinas said things you didn't expect him to say. And you're wondering, what changed in history? What's changed between now and Aquinas? Aquinas died almost 800 years ago. What happened in the meantime, such that mainstream religious views in this country, in our culture, have tended to shift? Well, to tell that story, I need to tell you about this guy, René Descartes. I need to tell you about René Descartes. He lived from 1596 to 1650. And the first thing you need to know about Descartes is say his name right. Don't be saying Descartes. That's not how it's said. If I hear you at a fancy cocktail party saying you read Descartes, everyone's going to laugh at you, and I'm not going to feel bad for you, because I told you how to say his name. It's Descartes. Like de Cart. You know, it's French. The French spell and pronounce things differently. So René Descartes. Now, Descartes has had a monumental impact on history. Why? It began with his obsession with certainty. You can call him the philosopher who was all about certainty. He had been a mathematician. In fact, you've probably seen his name before. Have you ever heard of the Cartesian coordinate system? Cartesian geometry? Cartesian algebra? Cartesian is just the adjectival form of Descartes. Just like Thomist is the adjective we use for Thomas Aquinas, Cartesian is what we use when we're talking about stuff that's about Descartes. So he was interested in math. and He liked math a lot because it gave him certainty. You know, in philosophy, you go through the philosophy department, and what do you hear us arguing about? Everything. We're just always arguing with each other. It's what we do. It's, 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 it's our, our stock and trade to argue, to have debates. But you go down to the math department, and it's not quite like that, right? It'd be weird if you were walking past the math department and you heard someone say, nah, uh 24 is the highest number. And somebody's going, 24? What about 18? No, that's not what happens. Mathematicians have certainty about their stuff. And Descartes wanted to know if he could get certainty about every one of his beliefs. Let me give you an example of just how difficult this is. I claim to know, I believe, that five years ago, I lived in the Bronx in New York. But you know, here's the problem. I have seen people have something called pseudo-memories. Pseudo-memories, fake memories. They believe things, they remember things that never happened. Psychologists say that all of us have pseudo-memories, including myself. So how do I know that my living in the Bronx really happened? How do I know it's not just a pseudo-memory? Or maybe it was all just a dream. And you say, well, look for photographs of yourself living in New York. Well, I find evidence, okay, I find what I think is evident, but again, it could be doctored, it could be faked, and again, I could be hallucinating. I could be hallucinating. You know, there's people who construct entire realities. They have mental illnesses, serious mental illnesses. They construct entire realities in their minds. How do I know I'm not like that? How do I know I'm not seriously delusional? So Descartes says, here's what we have to do. We have to wipe the slate clean. We have to abandon every one of our beliefs for a moment. And we're going to start building a system. And we're only going to admit beliefs that we are absolutely certain of. 
He says, how do we do this? How do we wipe the slate clean? Well, he says, consider this possibility. It's the evil deceiver possibility. Consider the possibility that I am in a reality constructed by a brilliant evil deceiver, like God, only deceptive. That's a possibility. I can't, I can't rule that out. How do I rule that out? I can't. And if that's a possible, possible scenario, that I'm living in a computer-generated reality, perhaps, something like The Matrix, if you've seen that movie. You should all see that movie to understand Descartes. Well, if that's possible, then it's possible that every one of my beliefs is false. So I have to wipe the slate clean. I have to abandon all of my beliefs. Descartes then asks, is there any belief that I have that I cannot abandon? Do I have a belief that I simply cannot convince myself isn't true? I could, I can question whether I'm in Los Angeles right now. Maybe this is a dream. This kind of feels like a dream, by the way. But maybe this is all a bad nightmare right now. I can convince myself that maybe, just maybe, I was never in New York. That maybe that was a dream. See, there, uh, well, I can question every belief. I can question my belief that I have made philosophy videos. I can question that. Then Descartes says he finds the one belief that he cannot question, the unquestionable belief. He says, I cannot deny that I exist. Why? Because I can question it. I can think about it. If I can think about it, I must. there must be an I there to think. So Descartes was known for saying this, I think, therefore I am. Therefore I exist. I think, therefore I am. This is Descartes' famous mantra, I think, therefore I am. And from that one belief, that one statement, he is setting out to rebuild his entire belief structure. How does he do this? Well, he says, okay, I think, therefore I am. Next question, what am I? I know that I am, but what am I? I'm a thinking thing. I'm something that thinks, something that has questions, something that's able to form beliefs, form doubts, have thoughts. I'm a thinking thing, i.e. a mind. I am a mind. Notice how different this is from Aquinas. For Aquinas, you're a body that's able to think rationally. For Descartes, you're not a body at all. You're not a body at all, according to Descartes. You're a mind. So he says, do thoughts have length? How heavy is a thought? What color are my thoughts? Well, those are all inappropriate questions. Minds aren't in space. So Descartes says there are two fundamental kinds of substances. Two. So we call this Cartesian dualism. Dualism means two. Twoism. Cartesian dualism. Cartesian twoism. There's immaterial, you might even say spiritual or mental substances, mental substances versus physical substances. Where physical substances are those things extended in three dimensions. Look how different this is from the Aristotelian or Thomas version of matter and formism. This is a complete rejection of matter and formism. Matter and formism says that substances 
like you, like a tree, like Mr. Whiskers, my cat, substances are matter that's formed a certain way. Cartesian dualism says there's actually two totally different kinds of substances. Mental substances and those substances extended in space. You are a mental substance that happens to be momentarily occupying a physical body. For Aquinas, when you die, that means your body decomposes. For Descartes, since you're not a body, your body can decompose, and your mind, who you really are, just keeps going. So think about all those stories you see about uh, people who claim to have out-of-body experiences. Out-of-body experiences entered our culture largely because of Descartes largely because of Descartes. Descartes gives us the idea of bodiless people, that there can be people without bodies. So there's a famous philosopher named Richard Swinburne. He writes about philosophy of religion. The first sentences of his book, his book is called The Coherence of Theism, and you can look it up on Google, the first page, he says, by theism, I mean the belief that there is God. By God, I mean a person without a body who can do everything, knows everything, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, not a person without a body, an idea which would have been totally incoherent to Aquinas. But it's what a lot of people think when they think about God. People who reject Aquinas often talk about God as a person without a body. That whole idea comes from Descartes. Descartes thought he could prove the existence of God. How? It's a very elaborate argument. I'm going to simplify it pretty tremendously here. It's what's called um, an ontological argument. What's that word? Ontological. That's a fancy Greek word, onto, which means existence. So it's an existence-based argument. And it works like this. God is, by stipulation, the most perfect being. God has every perfection. Now notice Descartes here again is, is the radical rejection of Aquinas, right? Descartes thinks he has a pretty good idea of what God is. Descartes thinks he has a pretty good idea of what God is. So these ontological arguments, a lot of philosophers make ontological arguments, by the way, they all have roughly this format. Roughly this format. There's just nuances between how they get given. I'm just giving you a very generic ontological argument. You call up a Descartes scholar, they're going to say, I'm getting Descartes not right. That's okay. You're just doing intro to philosophy. I just want to show you what an ontological argument is to show you something like what Descartes did. Premise one, God has every perfection. God's the best possible being. Premise two, it is better to exist than not. Existence is better than non-existence. I tell you, my wife, she's the smartest woman I know. She's the most beautiful woman I know, the most generous woman I know. My wife has only one flaw. She doesn't exist. You know, I would prefer to be married to someone maybe not quite so smart, not quite so beautiful, not quite so generous, but existed. Existence is better than non-existence. You want a million dollars? Tell me if you want a, an existent million dollars or an imaginary million dollars. 
You want the existent million dollars. So if God has every perfection, if God is the most perfect being, God must have existence. Descartes gives another argument also for the existence of God. It goes like this. God is infinite. I only have experiences of finite things, but I have an idea of God. How did I get this idea of God unless God gave it directly to me? It's impossible. The only way I can get an idea of something infinite is if God, if the infinite substance, which is God, provided it to me. That's Descartes' other argument for the existence of God. So philosophy takes a radical turn, starting with Descartes. Descartes is called the father of, quote, modern philosophy. Modern philosophy, believe it or not, ended uh, about 200 years ago. Uh, that's how most scholars divide up the history of philosophy. But Descartes considered the first in a, a roughly 200 year period of philosophers called the modern philosophers. Because they all are very interested in the question of knowledge and certainty. That became a defining characteristic of philosophy for a while. <clears throat> so we're going to look at one more modern philosopher. In our next lecture, we're going to look at a guy called David Hume, because he also has an important consequence for philosophy of religion. He's one of, if you're, if you're somebody who likes Aquinas, if you're somebody who likes Aquinas, uh, I think the biggest threat to Aquinas might be David Hume. So we'll look at Hume next. I think you're doing well, doing great, learning about Descartes. Rewatch the parts of this lecture that you found confusing. Comment below, send me questions. I'm flying to Florida tonight. I'll be going down to Florida to weather out this pandemic with my mother. She lives down there in Fort Myers. Uh, so I'll be back up and running here in a few days. See ya.